Welcome everyone to another great InfoFit Educators webinar. I am Andre Noel Potvin. I'm founder and president of InfoFit Educators. And tonight we have an amazing webinar called uh, the Total Knee and Hip Replacement Client Safe Return to the Gym. I am very well acquainted with uh, total knee replacements. I've had two of them uh, of my own, so I am well aware of the rehab process with it. That said, I would like to introduce you to our presenter this evening, Chris Gellert. Chris has his master's degree in physical therapy from Nova Southwestern University and an advanced master's degree in musculoskeletal uh, and sports physiotherapy from from the University of South uh, Australia. He is the CEO of Pinnacle Training, an education and consulting company that specializes in providing continuing education credits for personal trainers, physical therapists, physical therapy assistants, and massage therapists. He has been uh, practicing as a physical therapist for 20 years with a strong clinical background in orthopedics, sports injuries, and spinal dysfunctions. He has been a personal trainer for 20 years as well and is an international fitness author and presenter for 15 years of age. Uh, so it's nice to have you here with us, Chris. Welcome, Chris. Nice to have you today. And you are now on the stage. Thank you, Andre. And thank you everyone for coming in tonight. I appreciate you spending the time. Bear with me, it's been a long day here on the East Coast. So I've been working since seven, so it's a 12 hour day. But my energy and my enthusiasm will continue on throughout this session. And I hope that you really enjoy my presentation. Um, what our objectives tonight are to for you to learn about what is the cause of total knee replacement, total hip replacement, and how does that relate in terms of function, some of the medical and physical therapy management of total knee replacement and total hip replacement and repair. Identify which exercises are safe versus unsafe based on biomechanics and science for those who have a total hip and total knee, not based on the Gellert method or anything that I think, <laughs> but based on science. And program design for total knee and total hip replacement clients. So how to work with someone and designing a program to uh, transition them from physical therapy or physio back to the gym and back to independence or back to the home. We talk about injuries as a whole. Most injuries occur accordingly to the fall ways. Trauma, some kind of fall. Poor posture, someone just slouching and leaning and sitting in an awkward position like this picture right here for many hours a day, which puts stress on the cervical, on the upper back, lower back, and obviously the shoulders. Repetitive strain injury, also known as RSI, what that means is someone who's doing something over and over the same way. And that could be, you know, like a, a postal worker here in the US or a postal worker or, or a UPS, or maybe lifting and doing the same direction over and over again, like filing. And that causes the tendon to break down. And then eventually degeneration. And what degeneration means is obviously a tendon breaking down, the joint breaking down, or the whole muscle shoulder complex breaking down. So those are the main causes. And when we talk about osteoarthritis, we're talking about tonight in terms of um, really what is what it is. And it's a degenerative change with a varied etiology. It's mechanical or breaking down within the joint. So this is the knee joint we're talking about, which is the knee. Some of the risk factors or contributing factors are someone who has a lot of weight or that load would put less stress on the joint. Muscle imbalances, particularly the quadriceps, bigger and stronger than the, than the hip, uh, hamstrings. Repetitive stressors, the type of job, just like here with this, this contractor work in the picture you see here, that stooping down, loading it, twisting, repetitive over and over again, causes the joint to break down. So some of the symptoms that I've seen in my career, and I have a little bit of arthritis in my hip, but I don't have any pain, but most patients that have knee or arthritis in their spine or knee is gonna describe it as morning stiffness, achy. Uh, it, it, it gets better as the day progresses. The more they move, they feel better. They actually like to move and motion is lotion per se. The day goes on and it gets a little worse and by evening it's, it's actually worsened again. And the reason why is that the partial pressure on the joint is increased. So there's more pain in the knee, below the knee. Uh, they'll have difficulty possibly squatting down 
um, weight bearing activities and, and thigh discomfort along the outside called the lateral thigh discomfort. So some of the symptoms. So what is the difference between osteoarthritis versus osteoporosis? I just put this up here so to, to educate you, the audience, in case you were confused, but um, there is a difference. Osteoarthritis obviously is a breaking down of the joint and there's inflammation. Osteoporosis is actually a breaking of the bone and wearing down of the bone. So it, the bone is actually degradating. It's, it's decreasing um, or depleting. So surgery is indicated when pain has really gotten severe. And most likely the individual or client is unable to walk well or perform their ADLs independently. That means activities of daily living. So uh, getting dressed, getting out of the bed, getting out of the car, and they're just in so much pain. They, maybe they try in therapy, they try in physio, and the physical therapy just hasn't really done much or it's only helped a little bit. Um, that's when they may go back to the surgeon and be considered for either a partial replacement of the knee or a full replacement of the knee, and that's a total knee replacement. So without getting too gory, which I've tried to not do and to spare you all a picture of, of the gore of, of a total knee, I've seen the surgery live. Like I said, I've watched nine surgeries. Um, as Andre said, you know, it is a very painful condition, painful surgery, excuse me, where without getting too graphic, they basically will make a perfect incision uh, or slice down vertically on the knee. They'll make an incision with a saw, which you can see in this part B picture of the distal or the femur bone and then the tibia. So it's perfectly cut. And then they put the prosthesis in and they put lag bolts to lock it in or to tighten it in and lag bolts in the tibia, lag bolts in the, in the femur and they suture back up with staples and they move the patella. So the patella is saved. The patella bone, the knee bones move pushed to the side and voila, you have a total knee. You put in a Ted Ho stocking and the Ted Ho stocking is to decrease or prevent risk of blood clot and of course swelling. And they're given some non-steroidals typically um, afterwards. Um, they may have a cane, uh, something to given to walk, especially in severe cases, which decompress, decompresses the low to the knee joint. When they come to therapy, they're typically walking with a limp, walking with a increased knee bend, and the calf and the quads are very, very tight. So what we do is try and not only educate them, but to uh, begin with the education about what about what the surgery, what they're going to expect. As Andre said, it they need to bend it, they need to move it, and why they need to bend it, and why they need to move it. Because if they don't, they're going to constantly have a limp for the rest of their lives. So manual therapy to straighten out the knee, manual therapy, myofascial release, soft tissue massage to work on the soft tissue, uh, joint mobilizations to stretch the joint, and a little thing I put on there: the prosthesis is is per the research lasts a good 15 to 20 years. But what will wear it down faster is things like jumping, running. Obviously, I don't think I've met anyone who runs with a prosthesis or a total knee replacement, but uh, deep squats, you know, pistol squats, you know, these kind of exercises will wear down the joint. Um, plyometrics with something I just don't recommend someone with a total knee to do. So the focus in therapy is decrease inflammation. Uh, we may use stimulation. We may use definitely uh, vasonomatic here in the US, and I'm sure you have that in Canada, which is a, a compression which ice, which works really well. Once they're discharged from therapy, um, this, the science should guide you on what to do, and I'll talk about the science uh, and what to focus on and what focus not focusing on. But a little bit of the therapy, these are the phases of therapy that we really, I guess, consider um, essential. So phase one, that first four weeks, getting extension back, doing straight leg raises, this picture on the far right, doing shorter quads, which is a picture on the bottom center, term knee extension, which is doing a, an exercise where you're straightening the thigh, which all improve extension, because if we don't have extension, walk with flexion, you're going to be having a limp, and that's going to put a lot of load to the knee joint.
and we use manual therapy again modalities and compression ice uh, we may use combined ice with stimulation to reduce the swelling and definitely heat on the calf or upper quad to relax the tissue and there's the vaso pneumatic in the us and i'm sure you guys have in canada we have Norman Tech, which is a, a, a passive device, which helps with recovery, especially for athletes. Uh, we use that sometimes, but also, again, Game Ready is a really great um, tool and a great um, intervention for reducing the swelling, helping straighten the knee, which works really well. That's called vasopneumatic compression. That's part of the, the rehab. Phase two is more about range of motion more about getting back their mobility. So rate, riding the bicycle is really important. Um, again, doing heel slides, squats, uh, stretching the hip flexors, stretching the quads, uh, working all those tight postural muscles in the front of the spine, in front of the hip, um, really need to be worked on and stretched out. Manual therapy by the physical therapist is huge so again you can see here moving that femur or sorry tibia on femur which help with bending the knee moving the femur on tibia which will help with straightening the knee and the working a lot on static stability again straight leg raises clam shells band exercises uh, hamstring curls until we get to phase three we really want a minimum 120 degrees of knee flexion <clears throat> excuse me so that's really important we get that um, per the research, you need 110 degrees of knee flexion to go up and down stairs. So if you only satisfy and get 105 or 100, you're not really doing justice for the, for the patient. That's really poor numbers. And as Andre said, you've got to move it or you lose it. And you definitely, um, people I've, or patients that I've met, you know, I, I warn them it's, it's not a lot of fun, but I try to tell stories and distract them and, and get them to do things that'll help alleviate in their discomfort, but I'm not into no pain, no gain, but we have to move it and we do things to help facilitate that. So wall slides, in-place lunges, reverse lunges, these are all exercises to help with working on mobility and working in, on making the legs stronger. Hamstring curls um, is also big. So why is it important to strengthen the glutes and the hamstrings to pair the quads? The reason why it's important to strengthen the glutes and the hamstrings is that they're weaker, they're a phasic muscle, according to Yanda and various research. So if we don't strengthen the maximus and the posterior chain, and we just focus on the quad, well, how can you get up from a chair, right? Because when you go from a chair, you're pushing up, it's the glutes and hamstrings followed by the triceps and lats. So the quads aren't really doing the work to get up from a chair. Yes, the quads are working to go downstairs, but when you go upstairs or from a chair, we need glutes, hamstrings, and glute max. So I wrote down here a three to two ratio, which is something to remember, and three sets of hamstrings to two sets of quads. I also stay away from doing leg extensions. Um, leg extensions as an open chain isn't bad, it's just not functional. And it's actually can create a lot of shearing um, and a lot of, well, not really necessarily shearing like an ACL, but more of, of discomfort below the kneecap. So I've, I've stayed away and really avoided for 21 years of doing open chain leg extension. Short a quad are good, but not a full long um, our quad with weight, with load. Um, again, why? Because I've found patients who have a total knee, they get a lot of uh, inferior or, or knee swelling below the knee that just stays in and lingers and lingers and lingers, and it really doesn't go away. And swelling can last at least three months, so it can be a while. So what do we do? Stretch the tight, stretch the hip flexors, because they tend to be tighter, and, and loading the interior front is going to create what? More compression to the knee, and that can create more of a, of a knee pain on top of post-surgical pain. Cross training with yoga, which help, help, and help enhances flexibility. Again, I mentioned stationary bike, and ultimately I will transition to the elliptical bike or elliptical machine. And again, folks should be on glutes, hamstrings, medius, and minimus, so the outer thigh as opposed to the posterior chain. What are some exercises that are safe? Um, I definitely want to reiterate 
this is based on science, it's not based on my opinion. So the leg press is really, really a good exercise. Again, you can see from the picture, you're getting co-contraction of the quad and hamstring. The load is obviously going through the knee joint here versus actually applying a load vertically. So there's less shearing and less uh, compression versus doing like a sissy squat or upside down or even doing squat with a barbell. Leg curls, so leg curls are great. Abduction, adduction, you know, they're functional sort of, but uh, I do a lot more open chain, I'm sorry, open chain, closed chain, and then progress ultimately to um, the pool and some other cross training activities as well, when appropriate. So I like doing, based on biomechanics, lunges, not deep lunges, but doing lunges, you can see these are both kind of deep lunges. So again, not going all the way down, body weight first, avoid going deep, and av avoid excessive loading, which would be um, like you see the picture on the bottom here. Um, the lunge is functional. It's co-contracts the quads and hamstrings. And then I'll do reverse lunge, diagonal lunge backward, but I usually don't do a lot of forward lunge, I do a lot of reverse. And the reason why going back or backwards or stepping to the side, so that's gonna work more that posture chain and unloads the knee joint. So always watch your knee not going past your toes. Again, we wanna avoid that shearing force. So that's something that you probably all studied and learned. And again, diagonal lunge, so they're more functional, kind of going at a V or a diagonal uh, motion. As I said, reverse lunge works glute maximus and hamstrings, secondary with quads based biomechanically. So these are really safe to do and very effective. Um, for someone who is into sports or was sports driven, I'll I'll tie in some medicine ball or a ball and make it a little more fun. Um, but again, the goal is, you know, someone who has a total knee, they're not going to be playing competitive sports. They can probably do pickleball and maybe a little tennis at a low speed, but they're not going to be, you know, cranking it out like they were before and doing high level jumping, running, uh, hopping, skipping. It's not going to happen because their prosthesis is going to break down. So I'll tie in, uh, again, the reverse lunge with medicine ball, a uh, forward lunge with medicine ball twist, and diagonal lunge with weight or a cable works really well. Um, but these are all really effective, and, and I've never had one patient come back to me and have a problem where they didn't um, successfully graduate from physical therapy. One of the things I do want to say um, before I go ahead I didn't put it in here and it's my fault, but I want to make sure that you're all, as you're listening to me tonight, and um, probably Andre too, as he's listening, that he didn't do this. What you don't want to do ever, ever, ever with someone with a total knee is do step downs. So when I say step downs, if you're stepping down off a step, for example, like a four inch step or an eight inch step, um, it's been shown, uh, not just it's been shown, there's increased compression force, through the knee, so the femur on the tibia. I actually had a colleague of a colleague of a friend who's someone who did this and fractured their patella. So single leg step downs, I would never show a client to do at home or in the gym. And that's the reason why I just wanna make sure you're all aware of that and just the reasoning based on science and biomechanics. So core work too, don't forget the core. Core, there's 29 muscles from the chest to the the pubic region and periscapular to the hip. Um, you can do external rotation with cable, reverse flies, dumbbell side raises. Again, these are all good exercises just to work on the shoulder and the core. Um, core can also include rotation, which you've seen, diagonal <clears throat> chopping, diagonal tandem, tandem in place, um, lunges, um, which I just said earlier, uh, planks, um, modified planks, um, Probably not modified planks because you're putting your knee down. If you put the knee down, you're using a pad or such, and then planks with a ball. 
So that's going to depend on your, your athlete or your athlete, your client accordingly and what they can do. But here's some, here's some core exercises. Again, you know, some pictures from static to dynamic. So you can see static is in place on the left with the plank, trunk rotation with the medicine ball cable on the right. My favorite is I was doing it today with a total knee and a, and a disc patient um, bridging with a ball. This this patient here, this picture with the woman with a black shirt and white pants, hamstring curls with the ball, alternate arm, alternate leg lift with the physio ball. Great exercise for strengthening the multifidus and the QL, so the part of the back. And again, if we're doing YTs and Ws, having something under their knees so they can kneel down, that can also do upper back with uh, weights or or tubing, which works really well as, as well. So it's another way of doing some of the core exercises. Unsafe, ineffective, scary, scary exercises are the following. Deep squats, which you can see on the far left, there's just no need to do it. There's no need for anyone to do a deep, deep squat who's had a total knee. You're just gonna wear down the prosthesis. You're gonna create peri um, or pain below the kneecap. It's called peripatellar. Pistol squats on the far right, that right side picture. No need to do it. I can't think of any time in my life I've ever shown a pistol squat, except maybe with a figure skater. And a figure skater isn't gonna spend a lot of time kneeling like that, but that's just a lot of load to the knee. And then of course, plyometrics. Mm -hmm jumping, hopping, you know, death jumps, it's just not appropriate. And, and literally if someone was doing that before surgery, their, day is, their days of doing that are over. Now, that doesn't mean they can't exercise and do some sports specific training, which I'll talk about, but their days of doing plyometrics or depth jumps are, are over because of the, of the loading factor, that compression load onto the joint, which stimulates the receptors and um, joint receptors and can receptors as well as pain fibers. One thing that I do want to advocate or advocate express that I think that um, I've done a better job in the last five or 10 years is getting people in the pool when appropriate for patients with a total knee, really effective, walking in the water, walking forward, walking backwards, doing diagonal steps, doing lunges, diagonal lunges forward, diagonal lunges back, work really, really well. Um, vertical exercises here, like this this patient or this picture on the far right with the aqua gear and the little dumbbells and the shoes on, versus doing horizontal um, swimming, which, yes, yeah, effective, but if you want to really work the whole core and the whole kinetic chain, I would be doing exercises that are vertical. So unloads the spine, you're decreasing load, you're going to create drag, which will actually create uh, the weight of the water and do the buoyancy principle, strengthen. Uh, intraarticular, which means inside, as well as extraarticular, which means outside. So really, really effective is doing exercise in the water when the incision is healed, um, which is usually around three months, give or take. It could be a little bit earlier, but around three months post-surgically. So walking at the water at least knee or waist level, water acts as a resistance and will strengthen the entire lower extremity. Swimming horizontal works primarily the upper body, as I just indicated. And vertical exercises with the belt in the deep end will unload the spine, decompress its analgesics, as well as strengthen the core. So really, really effective. So again, single leg step downs creates a compressor load to the knee joint. Pistol squats, you can see here, deep squats are just exercises to stay away from. Don't do it. I also don't like stiff-legged deadlifts where you're locking out the leg. It doesn't mean you can't do deadlifts, but just don't lock out the knee. And I think if you look at the load, where is that load going through? Right down through the knee. So in terms of a prescription, again, is that a really good exercise to choose with someone with a total knee? And the answer is no, it's not. The compressive or load can create excessive uh, compression and load to the patellofemoral joint, PFJ, and that tib femoral joint as well. So I just, I stay away from, from um, doing these kind of exercises with someone with total knee. 
We talked about leg extension. There's leg extension, contraindicated only because of the shearing, and that can put a lot of pressure peripatellar. And it's just not functional. It's not it's not close connect chain, which I feel close connect chain are, are more functional, especially for ACLs, meniscus, total knees, total hips, um, bursitis, uh, several conditions that I, I, I've talked about or you probably heard about. So again, plyometrics, jumping up, jumping down. Um, someone comes to you and they wanna do in place jumps and they wanted that. I mean, maybe you can sprinkle in a few reps, but I would not be doing a plyometric program with someone who has a total knee. Never, never, never. Um, the days of getting power or increasing speed are over because that's what plyometrics do. You're taking uh, through the eccentric phase and then the amortization phase and the concentric phase, muscles that's shortening and elongating. And then you're getting that rapid split uh, to the actual spindle and fibers to improve power and the fast twitch. So I just, one thing you have to have a talk with your clients that plyometrics are out. What are in are hiking. I love to hike. This is a great picture, you know, it's a stock picture um, when appropriate, great for co-contraction of the quads, hamstrings and glutes and very safe. Pickleball, low impact, social fun. It's a good workout not a ton of load on the knee and it's huge in the US. I don't know how about in Canada. I'm assuming it's popular there as well, but it's growing in popularity and I've had a lot more people playing and taking up pickleball. So as opposed to tennis. So when we talk now about hip arthritis, Osteoarthritis, again, as I said, is one of the most common form of movement disorders that I see as a physical therapist, just like McDonald's. McDonald's is everywhere, right? And I don't know about you guys in, in Canada, but McDonald's are everywhere here in the US. And the type of food or the actual diet of obviously eating something like McDonald's is nothing but fat. Obviously, there's a, not much nutritional value in McDonald's. So the more we have as consumers, as physical therapists and physios, as personal trainers, as movement specialists, the more we can help our clients. And obesity is huge. When I was in Australia for a year, 2011, they're the second leading um, overweight country or obese country next to the US. US is number one. We are number one, which is not something to be proud of. So obesity is huge. Can we help? Can we change obesity? And the answer is yes. That's through education, through eating healthier, through regular exercise, resistance training, and creating a deficit, making it and being consistent in an exercise plan. And not forgetting water or aqua therapy too, which is huge because it's a great form of exercise. So again, per Ewing, Osteoarthritis is the most common reason for having total hip and total knee. The hip is a common site for osteoarthritis effect between 25 to 45 percent of population of those over 55 years of age, according to Sutliv and Zhang. When we talk about how arthritis develops, in the actual um, hip, it's a degenerative change with loss of articular cartilage within the joint. And then osteophytes, which are bone spurs and the subchondral bone starts to begin to harden. So there's a limitation in what's called the capsular pattern where instrumentation of the hip is more limited greater than the external rotation, or I should say by hip flexion, hip abduction. Again, someone with hip arthritis is classically gonna say or state morning stiffness, just like the knee arthritis in the morning, improves during the day, worse by evening, 
and usually there's some fatigue and pain associated. So contributing factors, just like with knee arthritis, again, aging process, muscle imbalances, which I typically see, which are typically tightness of the hip flexors, tightness of the quads are stronger and do more dominant and limited in the range of motion, which is how much movement. And then the weaker gluteus maximus and minimus and medius, as opposed to the hamstrings. So some other additional factors of adding to hip arthritis is genetics, comorbidity, talked to obesity earlier as well, smoking, Smoking is going to deplete the bone of oxygen and red blood cells. And there's a lot of correlation between a high body mass index and that leading to osteoarthritis or even FAI, which is called femoral acetabular impingement. And what that is, if this is your femur and this is acetabulum, it's just like a shoulder impingement. It's where the femur bone, when you abduct your leg, or flex, it impinges in the acetabulum. It's called femoral acetabular impingement. There's two types, cam and pincer. It affects more commonly dancers. And sometimes they'll have to have surgery. But again, you know, in terms of we're talking about arthritis tonight of the hip. You can see here with someone's arthritic hip. I have an arthritic hip. I have no pain in my hip. Um, why I have arthritis, I have no idea, except I guess I'm a little overweight still, but I, I don't think I'm obese. I'm a little, which could be, but I have no hip pain. I stretch every, almost every day, almost every other day. And my motion is really good. I have full knee flexion, full hip flexion. I do a ton of glute work. And so it's all I can do. When the summer comes, I'll be in the water again in the pool and um, the lake, but also I'll probably be doing yoga starting that soon again. And that way of cross training and things that we talked about before would recommend someone with hip arthritis. So when we look at assessment and screening tools for active movement, look at them squat. Here on the left is a, a functional squat. On the right with the arrow is someone going into genuvalgum, watching them walk on the treadmill. They're getting, this picture here is a little bit of interrotation, a little bit of Trendelenburg, which is a dropping of the pelvis, which is due, weakness due to the gluteus medius. Single leg step down test. Again, something that I wouldn't do with a total knee but total hip definitely can do. And that would be maybe off a small little pad or a box, but not more than four inches and see how do they land? Do they lean to one side? Does the femur drift towards midline, which is that valgus deformity or valgum? There you go, what it looks like the step down test. What muscles will be typically tight with a total hip? Well, hip flexors, IT band, quads are most common, and the rotators. They'll be tight and weak. And the calves, gastrocnemius and soleus. So that arrow is pointing to the IT band, and can I stretch the IT band with someone as a hip replacement? The answer is no, because if you take the leg towards midline, that femur will go what? Boop, pop out backward or to the side. So you can't stretch someone with a hip replacement with their IT band. With OA of the hip, no problem, right? You can do uh, an adduction stress or 
adduct to stretch, which worked on the IT band, worked really good and really well, and I recommend it. As I said earlier to Andre, and I'll say it to you guys one more time tonight, anyone who has arthritis and they're gonna have surgery, you wanna help them get as flexible as possible because the more flexible that they can develop and or flexibility, the more they go into the surgery flexible, they're gonna come out more flexible post-surgically. I'll repeat that. The more flexible someone can go into a surgery, whether it be a total knee or total hip, they're gonna come out more flexible and less pain. Been shown in research in definitely my 21 years. So that means stretching quads, stretching hip flexors, stretching the calves, and stretching the IT band. Those are all postural muscles. Phasic muscles are muscles that are weak, work on glute maximus strengthening, bridges, hip extension, glute medius and minimus, um, I'm sorry, glute maximus bridges, hamstrings, which is curls, and medius and minimus, which are sidestepping or clamshells. Okay, so there's medius, there's minimus, and a little bit of the hamstring for the research. And we can't forget the actual abductors as well. So that's medius and minimus. So muscle length assessment, and this is something that I encourage you to do, looking at muscle length, um, how is their muscle length compared to one side versus the other? So I'm looking at the, at the left hip flexor mobility or length, IT band down left, and then on that bottom right picture, looking at calf flexibility or calf assessment how flexible the calf is. So IT band, that's the standing wall test. And this is again, only for someone with hip arthritis, not having a hip replacement. So you're looking at hip flexors, quads, IT band and that standing wall test. Total hip replacement surgery, you can see here, There's various surgical approaches. There's the anterior approach. There's the lateral approach. And there's the posterior lateral approach. What are the hip precautions? Uh, hip precautions are again crossing the leg towards midline, sitting in a low chair, or into rotating the femur. Those are all the hip precautions that we want to tell the patient and when they're in therapy. Sometimes surgeons will say that a patient will have no precautions, which is scary, which means they can do anything, but that's up to the physician. And if a physician says that, then that needs to be communicated to the patient, but I'm still one to be very cautious, okay? So there's different approaches, posture, lateral, and anterior. Anterior approach, again, spares the tissue, allows for fastest recovery. It's a smaller incision with improved mobility. Um, the approach does not require dividing muscles from um, within the glutes and spares the glutes, enables the glute medius and minimus to be strengthened sooner. The incision is made to via the TFL or tensor fascia lata, and it also, allows the surgeon to have access to the hip capsule. So what are the standard hip precautions I just said? Crossing towards midline, interrotation of the femur, and sitting in a low chair. Posterior approach, again, procedure again, they lie on their side. Surgeon makes a incision about two centimeters posterior to the greater canner exposing the glute medius and maximus and as opposed to the anterior approach the posterior has some drawbacks include posterior precautions which prevent potential complications as essentials as possible dislocation of the femur so here's a posterior lateral approach 
line made on the lateral or outside posterior of the glute, six inches above the femur. You've got these jaws of life pulling apart, and then the, obviously incisions made. The tensor fascia lata and gluteal muscles across the greater trainer are dissected. The external rotator muscles are exposed, so that would be piriformis and the Gemelli brothers and obtrans internus and externus are exposed, and they divide the hip capsule. The femur is exposed by placing these retractors under the femoral neck and a second under the quadricep. And that femoral stem is inserted into the medullary canal. So some do's and don'ts, like we said earlier, what can potentially dislocate the client's hip who has a hip replacement? Crossing the legs, that's called adduction. Why? Because when you cross your leg, the leg goes towards midline and that femur is going to be going laterally, okay? Excessive end of range hip extension, that would be the TRX. I would never ever put someone in TRX with a total knee or total hip. Uh, I think it's too much load and special for total hip to possibly dislocate their hip. Something I've never done and never will do. And then deep end range squatting, what we've talked earlier, there's that picture right there. What they can do, they can do hip extension, they can do hip abduction, they can do uh, reverse lunges and external rotation as a whole, which we've talked about a couple of times now. So what is the focus of physical therapy? Again, it's to educate the patient, manual therapy to restore the mobility first of the tight fascia, stretching the tight, again, quads. So stability exercises such as bridging, clamshells are really effective Then hip abduction bridging. And again, once the patient's discharge from therapy, transitioning back into the gym should be based on science, not guessing. And that's stretching the tight, strengthening the weak, which I've said a couple of times, and what muscles to stretch and what you can see here are strengthened. Functional strengthening, not using your cat, but you could, right? So, what muscles do you want to target that are weak? Maximus, low back, extensors. So that could be bridging with a ball, uh, physio ball. That could be doing uh, in-place squats, uh, not going deep, but in-place squats. Um, reverse lunge, diagonal lunge are all very effective. And if you've got a machine, leg press machine works really good. Leg curls, of course, accordingly. Or use the cat. But cat's not the greatest piece of advice. So hamstrings, gluteus, medius, and minimus, and don't forget maximus. What needs to be stretched? Hip flexors, quads, accordingly, and calves. So post-therapy, what do we wanna to continue to do? Well, we wanna continue to work on improving endurance. So how do we do this? Through a periodized walking program, yoga and aqua exercise, balance exercise such as static feet together, arm lift, one foot in front of the other like this, three point touch on a pad doing three point touch on a half roll, progress from static to dynamic, functional strengthening that targets the glutes, hamstrings and hip stabilizers. So that's leg press here, lunges. I wouldn't do excessive leaning over flexion with a lunge. I, I, I don't know what that exercise is doing and it's to put a strain in the back. I found this picture and I just thought it was crazy. And then the TRX, I, I would stay away from too. Just too much uh, load, a longer lever on the hip joint for possible dislocating the hip joint. These are some dynamic core and balance exercises. So monster walks with the TheraBand around the legs on the far left. There's yours truly uh, doing a reverse lunge. So I'm stepping on a half roll and I've got tubing pulling me laterally while I step back. And then this picture is 
I'm doing the in-place lunge straight down, but there's two sports cords that are pulling on side to side. One's pulling left, one's pulling right, and I'm doing medicine ball trunk rotation. So that's really dynamic core exercise or dynamic stability uh, stabilization training. Very, very effective. Again, more effective with your athletes, but again, use it uh, per discretion of your client and what you think the client can or cannot handle. Back to post-therapy training, core strengthening. So there's again, the far left picture. Uh, again, reverse lunge with trunk rotation at the same time. Bridging with a physio ball. Bridging with hamstring curls and doing some cable diagonal chop motion works really well. So the patient should avoid deep squatting and single leg squats. As I said earlier, that compromises the prosthesis, making it susceptible for dislocation and creating deep hip pain. Just don't do it, just something to stay away from. Other types of training, yoga, Pilates, Again, earlier, aqua therapy, hiking, maybe step class, running, not realistic. Running is not realistic with someone with a total hip. You're breaking down that joint by compression, 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 repeated over and over and over and over again. So I am highly recommending you stay away from running with someone with a total hip and total knee. Um, but again, someone with a total hip can play pickleball, can do some light tennis. Um, I don't know about racquetball, but tennis. Um, and it works really well. So training the hip arthritic client, aqua therapy has been very, found, uh, very effective to found to reduce pain and physical function and mobility. I said that with a total knee. So total hip as well. Strengthen the phasic weaker muscles. The gluteus medius and minimus, minimus are abductors or in the frontal plane. So clam shells, stepping abduction, adduct, abduction and diagonal abduction work the muscles. Strengthening specifically the abductors and various studies when compared to general strength and resulted in significant reduction in hip pain, objective change in function. So a lot of evidence been and studied on uh, looking at the gluteus medius and minimus muscles as part of your strengthening plan or program. Exercise to avoid single leg and deep squats. Again, as it places a lot of compressive forces on the hip joint. Said that a couple times. Um, golf, very realistic. Got a lot of golfers here in the US, I'm sure in Canada. Important to clarify with the prior therapist and need to be aware of the hip precautions. But in terms of you know swinging a club, they can typically do it between four to six months with putting, chipping, and gradual return to golf. Tennis, they can ease back into it. Begin with hitting the ball against the wall, doing volleying, then playing a few sets and progress and build up their endurance. That's a really effective way of getting someone playing tennis or pickleball. You can see the muscles involved with tennis. You've got your core, your abdominals, your quads. Really, really effective exercise for keeping active. Some sports civic training. Um, way to improve golf, standing on a half roll, using a, that's a makeshift club there and having them swing. Then the second picture is a personal trainer I worked with who I've got him doing TheraBand around his ankles and swinging a club or, or a stick, which the application is going to be improving kinetic chain and control, working on improving trunk stability and total engagement of the lumbopelvic junction. So really, really effective. 
Again, golfing continued, kneeling medicine ball throw. So not all the way down kneeling, but partial kneeling, diagonal chop with a cable, standing medicine ball toss, great for improving rotational power. What is functional for someone with their arthritic hip? A functional squat versus deep squat. Lat pull downs, very effective. We talked about leg press earlier. Diagonal or reverse lunges as part of your program design. Seated mid row, seated side raises, bent or elbow straight, reverse fly. I love the leg press machine, leg curl. Staying away from leg, single leg pistol squat and sumo squats. I'm not a big fan of sumo squats. I think that puts too much load to the um, hip joint, but that's my opinion. And that deep squatting, we want to stay away from. Stay away from the deep, 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 deep squat. So core, someone with the arthritic hip slash hip replacement. Again, you've got a plethora here, I, I, I've said earlier, but these are some different. So static exercises, um, planks, standing trunk rotation um, for the young whippersnapper and a younger um, arthritic hip, you know, doing T-bridges, that far left picture is a really great exercise. But um, I like these next row of exercises, um, which is under dynamic, which you can see here, I'm, I'm on a half roll with my feet and my elbows are on a full roll, that would be probably more for an athlete than a total hip or arthritic, arthritic client. But again, um, use your discretion. Prone alternate arm, alternate leg lift on the physio ball in the center there. And then we just talked about doing um, trunk rotation with a lunge. And then that picture next over is hamstring curls and then single leg hamstring curl bridge. Really wonderful on the glutes and hammies and on that lower back. Multi-directional training, which again, you can do for almost any client. The bottom left has me doing a left rotation with reverse, I'm sorry, left rotation with a four left lunge. And there's a force pulling me posteriorly backwards. So that's working my, my extensor muscles, my back. And then here, I've got a sports core to pull me back, but pull me on the right side is I'm going to the left. So another way of rotating the spine. So as I said earlier, thank you for a wonderful being a great audience. Um, the certified post rehabilitation specialist is a certification that we offer with PTCS as well as through InfoFit. If you have any questions, please let us know. Contact InfoFed or PTCS with any more questions you may have, or if you'd like to purchase. I'm confident that if you have an interest in becoming post rehabilitation certified as a post rehabilitation specialist through Pinnacle Training Consulting Systems, that you're going to have the knowledge, the insight, the understanding of how to take the foundation science, the functional assessments, and apply it accordingly to work with anybody accordingly, just like total knees and total hips. I want to say thank you. Thank you to Andre. Thank you to Della. Thank you everyone at InfoFit. And I'm glad and I hope that you've had an entertaining session tonight. And I will entertain any questions you may have. And before I entertain questions, if you'd like to email me, you can email me at ptcg1999 at verizon.net. That's ptcg1999 at verizon.net. And you can see our website right here accordingly. I'll turn it back over to Andre. Wow, thank you very much, Chris. That was amazing. Amazing detail, great information on exercises. I just want to share a little story with you. Uh, when I had my most recent knee replacement, uh, it was during the height of COVID. So there, you weren't allowed to see any physios in person and the pools were closed. So uh, it just added a little uh, interesting twist to uh, rehabbing the total knee, but we did it. Um, okay, we got some amazing questions. So let's start off with question number one. Um, if you can't do single leg step downs, how do you train to go downstairs? <laughs> Great question. So if you can't do, well, let me reiterate, a therapist should 
have trained, worked with, and developed the ability for the patient to go downstairs reciprocally. If they're still having difficulty doing that, meaning going downstairs, you can take a TheraBand around your foot and take a small, basic, a little baby step, like you know, a two inch step, and do step downs off a small and step. What I said earlier was I don't want patients and I don't train patients to go down four inches, eight inches or higher because the risk of teller fracture. So you wanna work on eccentric control. So the therabands are around the foot. And I think I have a theraband. No, I don't have a theraband around me here. But if you can visualize, this is my foot and there's a theraband around it and you stepping down with the theraband, coming back up, stepping down, that works on that eccentric control of the, the quadriceps. Great. And let me go back to my questions. Okay, next question. How does the knee stabilize without an ACL and PCL ligament? How does the knee stabilize without an ACL and PCL ligament? Yeah, like the, moving forward and backwards. Oh, okay. So it stabilizes because the of the composite of with of the load that's going through the prosthesis. So basically you're working on not just the mechanics of the prosthesis, but working on the utilizing the muscles and the soft tissue around the joint, number one. Number two, the patella is still there intact. So the job of the patella is a transmit force, but obviously that's transmitting force from above the knee, below the knee. But actually the control part is the prosthesis and the muscles around the actual prosthesis and the posterior chain that's how you actually have control within the prosthesis and actually as a whole from a stability perspective. Okay, great. Um, I know you say no pistol squats after a total knee replacement, but mm -hmm. how do you feel about them when someone hasn't had a T total knee replacement, but just has knee arthritis? I don't like them. No, not at all. I, I, don't, see, I don't see the need for doing them. I think they're very aggressive. Um, I don't see why some would do it. And I think they're, they're just, it's placing the knee in end range flexion, which is putting a lot of stress to it. Um, I have had a lateral meniscectomy and I don't even do deep squats anymore. And my knee is doing great. Um, I used to squat, I'm gonna get back to the gym and to answer to your audience um, with COVID here, I'm getting back, I've been working on at home. I'll probably do some maybe leg press and some other things at the gym. But my days of, of doing deep squats and heavy squats are over because I also have some spinal asthesis. So I think someone who has, you know, mild arthritis, why put it and make it risk for making it more or maximal or severe arthritis? I just don't think you should do it. I, that'd be my answer to your question. Okay. I have hip osteoarthritis and can't externally rotate my hip mm -hmm. due to an acetabular cyst. What mm -hmm. other glute stretch can I do? So the person can't rotate externally because of cyst. What mm. else can they do? Um, Good one thing that, yeah, to stretch. One thing that could be done is someone actually having, you know, a partner or someone have you have them pull on your leg and do some distraction. That would be something I would do. That would be feel really good. So a general distraction to the femur. Um, if you can't get into instrumentation, you may have to may do a modified instrumentation. Um, honestly, I think if you're having that much limitation, um, getting in the pool, trying yoga would be great. And if that still works, doesn't work, I would see a physical therapist or a physio in your neck of the woods to answer your question. Great. What is the best quad stretch for someone with a total knee replacement? Best quad stretch. I've actually talked to surgeons about this and I've, I've never got a really good answer and I can't find any real good research on you know, which is more effective research base. So I would say more effective would be soup, um, sorry, prone on their stomach because you're taking away the hip flexors than when you lie on your side. But when you stand, it's harder to do because you're putting all that weight on the opposite, opposite knee or contralateral knee. So I would say most effective would be uh, prone on their belly and doing a stretch that way. If that's still difficult and they can't do it, then doing it sideline versus standing would be recommended. 
what is the success rate of corticosteroid injections to help with osteoarthritis prior to a joint replacement? Great question. Very good question. And you know what the answer is, Andre? I don't know. I don't have the research. Um, I found, I can talk to you testimonially speaking, which is not, or anecdotal, uh, it's probably about 50% from my 21 years of doing this. Um, and you can only have three injections per year because that obviously is going to deplete the bone. So unfortunately, I don't have the research and evidence to back that up, but I'm going to say about 50% percent success rate accordingly. Okay. Once I have a hip replacement, can I ever abduct my leg ever again? Adduct or abduct? Add, adduct. Add, oh, adduct. Um, the answer is no because of the precaution and the, the the compression when you go into adduction the leg coming across the body the femur is going to be displaced laterally unless the physician has said you can do it and you have no precaution no no risk no no issue then you don't worry about it but i would always err on the side of caution about doing any kind of adduction or crossing over accordingly that that's the way i've been doing for 21 years and I, I've never had anyone knock on wood, dislocate their hip, hip or, or pelvis because of that accordingly. Can you do isometric adductions with your feet hip width apart with maybe a, um, a stability ball or um, uh, yoga pads between your knees? So you're not adducting past the midline, but you are strengthening the adductors. Yes, you are, but what's the what's the problem with that? With isometric, isometric is is no change in the length tense relationship of the muscle. So you're actually not getting stronger adductors by doing isometrics, Andre. You can only get stronger by adding a load. So if you want to strengthen your adductors, you can do theraband or an ankle weight and do it sideline. You know, bringing the the effect leg up to to that, but 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 you're laying on your side. What I'm saying is crossing your leg over, you can't do, right? You could also do adduction uh, to midline where you're standing. Uh, and if you're doing this, but not crossing over. Mm -hmm. But the adductors in my 21 years of doing this and in general are weaker and tighter. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Are tighter, not weaker, tighter and stronger than the abductor so i typically don't do a lot of adductor strengthening with a lot of patients and or hip replacement or hip arthritis accordingly so that's what i would how i would answer that question perfect um how long do you have to stay away from squat after a hip replacement great question usually about um usually it used to be 90 degrees after four weeks now it's 110 after six weeks and really at eight weeks you want to have at least 110 if not 120 degrees of knee bending so squatting in the gym or doing squats probably six weeks or so give or take um but functionally you're squatting right when you get off the toilet right when you get off the chair right so you're you're really using uh, doing a squat functionally right after surgery so you want to use it, but doing a freestanding squat, that's accordingly when you would start actually doing it. What's the difference between doing a leg press and a squat for the arthritic hip? What's the difference between doing a leg press and a squat for the arthritic hip? The difference is one major thing, load. When you're doing a leg press, the load is transmitted this way in the transverse plane, right? When you're doing a squat, the load is vertical, so you're fighting gravity 9.8 meters per second squared. So if you're doing a vertical squat or Smith machine squat or back squat, um, you've got to fight gravity. So it's actually beneficial to squat partially if you've got an arthritic knee, but I wouldn't be incorporating, <clears throat> excuse me, a ton of squatting exercises into a regimen. I would incorporate some, but incorporate more non-weight bearing um, in conjunction with weight bearing accordingly. Does that make sense? That's what I would how I would approach someone with an arthritic knee. But, and the key but is, Andre, if someone has an arthritic knee and it's mild and very painful, why load the knee overloaded it? 
it needs to be strengthened in a way that's not going to overdo it accordingly. And that would be uh, leg curls and uh, reverse lunges accordingly. So again, you've got to look at your client. Um, I've got to look at my patients and you've got to look at their symptoms, how much knee bending they have, what's the integrity of the, of the x-ray and of the femur. Uh, accordingly, these are all things that we have to think about as clinicians and as personal trainers. With a hip replacement, can I still jump rope? Mm hmm Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, would PRP or prolotherapy help with pre and or post total knee or total hip replacement? That was Sean asking that question. PRP is, that's a great question, Sean, is, I don't know how it is uh, received in the, in the, in Canada. Uh, it's controvert, not controversial in the U.S., but it's it's not um, completely 100% received in all by all physicians in the U.S. Number one, according to American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and surgeons I've worked with. Number two, PRP is more usually used for ligaments and tendons than joints, so you're really not going to get more stimulation or growth with that. You, you're going to get it with a tendon issue or uh, a ligament issue. And thirdly. The research is, is skewed, so I would get many pieces of advice. Um, I would get several um, pieces or or comments or input from definitely different doctors before I did prolotherapy. Last question: Can I do high inclines on a treadmill following a total knee replacement? Great question. Can you do high inclines on a treadmill? The answer is yes. So what are you doing with a high incline? You're working glutes, hamstrings, and calves. What I don't want to do, and it would recommend you stay away from, is doing decline or doing all this eccentric downward control with a load, right? That would be something that I would stay away from, which loads the knee joint or the quad. So loading it going up, not so bad, a problem. That's not, that's not, not really an issue because the force you're using the glutes maximus and hamstrings to propel you up the hill or up the treadmill great just uh, some feedback for you great info thank you says della thank you this was so informative says patricia and um like to say uh thank you says patricia thank you says kian so uh you're a hit there chris thank you thanks andre yeah. thanks so for your time thank so in closing, thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. And on behalf of InfoFit Educators and Chris Gellert, thank you for joining us today and have a great evening. And this meeting will self-destruct in five seconds. Five, four, take care, everybody. Three, two, one. Bye-bye now.